on this episode we approach a mild inconvenience. The Great Wall of Schmups. And then we do some light UI work. We have to deal with all those weird edge cases. Ugh. But we still find the time for empathy and mindfulness. Oh yeah baby! Get wrecked! <laughs> Mm. Hi everybody, I'm Christian. Welcome to Lazy Devs Academy. Welcome to a little schmuck tutorial. Yeah! So, this is episode number 19. And we're getting serious. I can tell we're getting into the end game now. I mean, it's still gonna be a couple of episodes until we finish, but I can already smell uh, the arcade fumes coming out of our game. Because I have to do a little confession, I've been to the doggy zone. As you have to sometimes at the end of the episode kind of like dig in and work on your own and kind of like understand what is happening. The same um, is true for me. Sometimes I just have to like dig in and you know figure things out myself before I do those episodes. And the problem that we're approaching here is um, this is a problem that I've seen with a lot of shmups uh, and I have a name even for it. I call this the Great Wall of Schmups. <laughs> Stupid name, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the Great Wall of Schmups is kind of like a phenomenon that comes up when you make schmup. Because if you think back on how we began this project, you know, the first steps were... I mean, we learned a lot, they were not straightforward, but they were also kind of... It was straightforward, it was kind of clear what we were doing, right? It was clear that we need to put a ship on the screen. It was clear that we have to move it. It was clear that we want to press a button and shoot a bullet. It was clear that we want to shoot multiple bullets. It was clear that we need an enemy. It was need that we it was clear that we need to collide the bullet. Like all of the steps were kind of really straightforward. We were always driven by necessity. We were always driven by like really like a very clear vision of what we have to achieve. And the only challenges that we really had to overcome were technical. We had to figure out how to do things, which I, as a beginner, sh for sure, is a big, big challenge. I That's why I'm here. But also, once you figure these things out, you you kind of like, you know, you, you have them, right? They're kind of like um, difficult to approach, um, but the question, the thing that you're working towards is always very clear. And that makes him kind of like, in hindsight, kind of like straightforward. But the problem is that now we're approaching it kind of like a different phase of the game development. Um, once like, the basics are done and the shmup looks like our shmup looks like now, where it's like you have a ship and you shoot and there's an enemy kind of like petering from nowhere. Then suddenly challenges that you have to deal with are of very, very different nature. Then the challenges suddenly you know, uh, uh, different types of problems start creeping in from the sides and those different types of problems are design problems. We have to figure out what kind of game we're actually working on. And that's a very different question than uh, figuring out how to do something. Um, and you don't re really notice how these problems um, uh, kind of start, start creeping in until they hit you like a wall. Suddenly you have to, like you get slower and slower, right? And then boom, you get stuck because you don't know really where to go next. It feels like you don't know how to make the enemies spawn, but in reality, it's the design that is lacking. You don't know if, you know, is this gonna be a space universe kind of thing where it's gonna be an array or this is like an area of enemies and you just like fly down? Or is it going to be something more flexible like in Galaga where there is an array but the enemies are flying in from the sides? Or is it going to be something like completely freestyle like with modern shmups where it's just the enemies are coming in on timer where every couple of seconds a new wave of enemy comes in? And because you haven't figured these things out, it might be difficult to implement them because you just don't even know even where you're going. And, and, and this, the problem becomes kind of like very intangible. And there's like multiple of those issues that hit you at once. And that's the great wall of shmups. And we're at the great wall right now, even in this tiny little shmup, even that tiny little shmup has a wall. And usually this is where tutorials say like, all right, you, we, we shown you the basics. Bye bye. <laughs> you, know, you can figure out the rest <laughs> because right now the difficult questions begin. But not this tutorial, because we are going to tackle the Great Wall. And I actually, that's why I did, went to the doggy zone, I tackled the, the Great Wall. Um, 
we kind of already started tackling this because we did decisions and decisions kind of like help us focusing, help us steering us in direction. Decisions can be wrong, but we just have to decide that we're going to figure out if they're wrong, right or wrong after we make them, after we actually implement them. And so, you know, we have to maybe undo some of the decisions, but we're going to trust our abilities to, um, to pull through. All right, so uh, we already made this decision that we're going to spawn waves, um, but today we're going to try to actually spawn the enemies that belong to a wave. Uh, so that's going to be a big goal for today, spawn waves. <clears throat> but before we go there, I wanted to do some house cleaning. Let us, let us load the game. I don't like this music. It's, don't get me wrong, it's a good music. It's come from the Galaga, obviously very classic, chiptune and so forth. But every time I launch this, I listen to this music and it drives me crazy a little bit because it's very long and very, very like in your face, you know. And also, uh, I was thinking, okay, maybe so, because in Galaga, this music doesn't play in a start screen, it plays when you start the game. So here, uh, when you start the game, right here, the, the music would play. We can do that real quick to, to kind of like get a feel for how that feels. This is start screen. Let's just put it in start game. It's too long, it's a little bit too long, the game already begins and the music is still playing and we still have the same problem that we, if we restart the game quite frequently, every time you have to listen to this music and it's a bit... Here's the problem, the music is... Um, uh, you have to see the music in context, right? If you are in an arcade, in a loud arcade environment where everything is blaring, right? And you have a quarter <laughs> that your mom gave you. Right? And there's this great big machine and there's awesome spaceships and you put the quarter in, right? You want to, it to start blaring music at you. You want to have like this experience like, yeah, I'm getting, you know, my money's worth. You want to hear this because maybe you never hear it again because it's your one quarter, right? So in this context, it totally makes sense to have like this amazing uh, jingle playing at you whenever the game starts. In our context, modern context, where we maybe going to restart this game often, especially for us, for us developers, but if you have to restart this game over and over again, that music is a little bit too intense. So I asked my friend Sebastian to do uh, to do some revisions on this. We kind of like discussed this a little bit, and and I had some ideas, and and he he came forth and he brought us two pieces of music that we're gonna uh, plug in. Now there is a problem. Now we're gonna have a start jingle. But the problem is that if we do the start jingle, then we don't have anything in the start screen. And I would love to have something in the start screen that kind of sounds pleasant that I can listen to over and over again, and that I'm not gonna that's not gonna drive me insane. And that's something that Sebastian sent us. Let's go. Okay, so I know this is not ideal. This is really not really good tutorializing because you know we the music comes out of nowhere. Uh, but again, I would probably suggest uh, you go, reach out to people who actually are really good at making music to learn how to make music. I actually did some music myself inspired by this tutorial. I got a little better at this. I might be able to explain a bit more how music making works. Um, we're going to move two pieces of music over and I wanted to maybe discuss uh, some details I noticed on how to transfer uh, music files, um, music data between files that are kind of like important maybe to, to keep in mind. Uh, definitely something that I had problems with. Right, so this is on the left side we have the donor card basically from that that comes from Sebastian on uh, on the right we have our uh, card um let's go to the music pattern so um, one of the first things is going to be uh, pattern number zero but that is also pattern number zero in our uh, case uh, Sebastian um, kind of like made th this pattern <laughs> He made this a little bit longer, so maybe we can use this as a starting jingle. Not anything too fancy, just like blah, 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 and then the game starts, you know, just like uh, to inform us that, you know, things are starting. So this is something that we want to update, and we're going to use one technique for that. And then over here, this is the start screen music. Beautiful. 
beautiful. Not quite as retro as Galaga was, uh, but maybe in a good way. So in this pattern editor, uh, when you copy things over, you copy the entire pattern and uh, the sounds associated with it. So let's just do this real quick because this is a completely new sound. Now we're just going to copy this over. So I'm going to go click this, copy. We already did that before. I just want to repeat this. Copy. And copy. These are just three patterns. Seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine. And as always on those episodes where I copy something over, I will also post the card from the beginning of the next episode and you can use this as a donor for these patterns okay and i'm also going to go through the individual melodies so we can copy them you know just by copying the individual notes or and that's always i think the best choice is you just compose your own music because i feel like copying other people's music doesn't really teach you anything about making the music it's just really just like <laughs> that's that's kind of like like the problem i think it's best if you start you know developing your own techniques Right, so this is just when we copy the entire pattern, but let us just um, do something like, what if you want to copy individual sounds? Because here, here's the thing, pattern zero, we already have pattern zero. It's just, it's missing the second part, right? So we just have to, oops, uh, stop. So we just have to upgrade those three sound files. These, is, these are zero, one, and two in our donor file, but in our... Uh, uh, recipient in our source uh, in our destination we have four five and six so we have to upgrade the, the music uh, the sound effects four five and six uh, so yeah let's look for them that's four right all right so four is basically zero in this one so we're gonna go to zero here that's zero Right? It's, it doesn't have the second part. And you would think something like, oh, let's just copy the second part here, right? Just copy these notes and just paste them in here. Uh, that doesn't work. Why? why? What? And then maybe copy this. Oh, it copied 50 notes. Can I copy them in here? Uh, what? Uh, nothing to pay? What? It doesn't work. Well, you have to change. The trick is you have to change the from the in a donor card you have to change the display from this table view to this view where you have like the the you draw the sound effects and then you can copy here and paste it here and now you have the upgraded sound all right so this is going to be sound number one again we're going to switch it to this view now we can copy the entire sound and we're going to overwrite sound number five our number five with it, uh, sound number five with this. And then finally, uh, sound number two. Again, we're going to switch it to this view, copy, switch it to this view, paste, uh, switch it to six and paste. Right, so let's, uh, now we basically replaced four, five, and six with those new sound effects. And now that sounds nice. Uh, let us implement these things real quick. So uh, when we start the game, we're going to go music zero. Uh, I'm not going to fade out. We're going to remove the fade out here that we had previously. And here in the start screen, we're going to start music. Uh, pattern number seven, I think, was the one. Making sure that this is the beginning of the loop. And pattern number nine is the end of the loop. So it will loop between seven, eight, and nine. It will just repeat this pattern here. All right, so music seven on the start screen, uh, music zero when we start the game. Now this seems more reasonable to me, right? This is reasonable to me, this, this looks good to me. Okay, so for you people out there, and you know, if you can download the file, that's okay, but for you people out there who cannot download the file, I will show you on the donor card what the sound files uh, look like so you can copy the individual notes again uh, i would probably not recommend it but uh, if you want to do this here you go so these are the notes for sound effect number zero from that's from the uh, start game jingle right so sound effect number zero sound effect number one again still belonging to the same jingle it's just three sound effects are layered on top of each other that's what zero sounds out and then sound effect number two. Right. 
So these are the three sound effects that um, that uh, result in pattern number zero. And now let's look at the sound effects that are responsible for the music, the uh, uh, start screen music. All right, so we're going to start at 15. It's kind of like the melody. 16. And there's kind of like some arpeggio happening. There's some um, switches happening down here. These are really cool. There's some detuned and dampened it a little bit. 18. Just like a drone. Like basically a bass, I guess. 20, and that was then uh, 21. 22, 23, and 24. All right, that was awkward. So, um, yeah, so we have the start screen music, that's good. We have this jingle, that's also good. Um, something I wanted to do is to make sure that there is the winning music is at the, comes at the end when we finish the game. So let's look this up. Four. Now we should hear some music, okay? So let's try to make this work. Uh, let's, uh, let's see, we had already this winning pattern. Yeah, that's the, so that's gonna be um, uh, sound pattern number four. All right, so it's gonna be sound like this. Okay. Okay. Um, so let us see. Where is enemies? Right here. Uh, if wave is greater than four, then we switch to the mode to to win, and that's also when we're gonna go music four. Let's see. Beautiful, beautiful. Something I noticed is that there's also no jingle when we finish a wave. There's just nothing happens when we finish in a wave. And again, we have a we actually have a pattern for that. No. That's this one. No, this one. So this is pattern number three. So let us start this as well. So in next wave. Um, well, basically it's when we start a new wave. We're gonna go if wave is greater than one, then because on the first wave, I guess we can actually start here the jingle. So let's go if wave equals one, then else end, right? So uh, on the first wave, we are on get, gonna actually run this music. We had this music on start game, um, but I'm gonna get it out of here. And I'm gonna put it here because here is where we uh, run the other music from the other waves. So I think it makes more sense here. So on wave one, we're gonna play the start jingle. Uh, and on all the other waves, we're gonna play the you've completed a wave jingle, which is um, uh, which is pattern number, I thought it was four. No, it was three. Okay, music three, there we go. So let, let's just run this. Start screen music, game begins jingle. All right. Something I don't like is how how the music is a bit too early. It's um, it kind of starts while the explosion is still happening from the last enemy from the wave. So maybe we want to uh, add a bit of the delay here, and that's hmm, that's spicy to add a the delay here. But instead of just doing it in code, we can actually add it to the actual patterns. So that might be a good idea. So let's try that. So this uh, this pattern here consists of sound effects 11, 12, and 13. So we're gonna go to the sound effect 11. 
that's here. And we're just going to move things a little bit down. We're just going to go uh, copy and we're going to paste them here. So I'm going to duplicate this. We're going to delete the old version. Uh, so it's now it's moved to the next uh, to the next column basically, right? And here is as well. We're just going to go. Can I cut it? No, I can only call, copy. Uh, copy paste basically copying the note to the next column for for um, the sound effects that consist of this of the jingle here. Let's try that. <laughs> A little bit too late now, I think. Uh, a little bit too late. Uh, let us move this a little bit up. And I'm sorry, this is, this is, I know this is not ideal. Uh, so I'm going to copy, delete, and I'm going to post it. Like, how about here, uh, halfway? So, uh, yeah, like here, uh, four empty notes. And then we're going to start. Copy, delete, paste. Uh, copy, delete, paste. Easy peasy. Now that is good timing. I like this. Perfect. Good. All right. So let's see what else else on my housekeeping list. All right. Hmm. Okay. Two things. And then we're gonna get to uh, to uh, to the to the task of the day. So one thing is, whenever enemies are leaving the screen, weird things happen. So look, there's an enemy and it leaves the screen, and then it just comes back. That's not good. That's not what we want. Um, so we did it because we just wanted to have like an endlessly spawning enemies. But today we're gonna fix this. So what I wanted to do here, when the enemy is leaving the screen. I just want to don't spawn a new enemy. Just delete it and that's it. So that's why when you just don't kill the wave, when you just let the enemy fly past. You should have been able to win the game, but you can't. Let's let's look what, what happened. I think the problem is that we check if the enemy if the wave is finished only when we actually kill the enemies. Uh, collision enemy bullets. That's right. Oh, yeah. If enemies equal zero, then okay. So let's go. Let's remove this out of this part. And let's put it at the very end of the update function. Check if wave over. <laughs> <laughs> easy peasy for breezy <laughs> well what happens now is there we begin the game with no enemies on the screen so we just like cycle through all of the waves until we finished um yeah so we maybe have to sure that make sure that this is only possible when there's actually an ongoing wave so um uh, we have to look so basically, if the mode is set to game, only then we are actually che um, checking if there's no enemies on the screen. So we're gonna go like if mode equals game and enemies number of enemies is zero, then we advance. Okay. That worked. Let me see if I can kill an enemy. Bam. Can I win again? And if you can see here, ah, oh, I remember now. We wanted to do something. We wanted to do something, we wanted to fix the collision detection. That's something that we're also going to have to do today. So many things! Oh my gosh! Uh, but first, there's another thing I wanted to address, because I noticed something. Let's say we have one of those players who just like really likes to mash the buttons. Just like, if he doesn't understand it, you can press the button. And let's say this player dies. So you see how I was able just to, to skip the screen before I noticed. And we had a special system. <laughs> that's, that's the frustrating thing. We had a system for this, right? Where is it? Update function. 
we had the system and everything where we checked if the button is released and, and only then we can proceed. But this system made an assumption that somebody keeps the button pressed. For the button measures out there, this will immediately register a release of the button and immediately register a press of the button. And then you skip through those end screens uh, before you can react and stop yourself from pressing the buttons, from pressing the buttons. So we have to introduce uh, an, another system on top of it. It has to be really robust and that's why UI can be a bit frustrating. You have to deal with all those weird edge cases. Ugh. We're going to call this um, button lock. Oh, keeping it all family friendly. Oh, just let's call this lockout. Lockout equals false. No, actually, we lockout equals zero. So here's here's how, how I'm intent to solve this. We have this variable t that we haven't done too much with yet, but we're gonna start doing stuff with it now. So the t measures the amount of uh, frames that have passed, and we saw see that at the beginning of the game we reset t to zero, but otherwise um, I think it's good. So what I want to do is now I want to uh, have a lockout, a variable that uh, when we uh, are about to show one of those screens, we're going to say, all right, we are currently on frame 2099. For the next 30 frames, we're just not going to accept any button presses. We're just going to ignore button presses for the next 30, 30, 30 frames. And once we have reached, you know, okay, let's say, let's say it was, what did they say, 3,099? Let's say it was frame number 2,000, right? This was frame number 2,000. So we're going to wait until it's frame 2,030. That's 30 frames. And only once T has reached frame 2,030, only then are we going to start listening to buttons again. And this will basically means that in the first second after the screen is shown, uh, there's no, the, 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 you know, the game won't react to button presses. Um, so let's do that. Um, so basically what I'm going to here do uh, here is when we lose the game, that's, it's going to be two um, positions where we need to, when we lose the game and when we win the game. Um, so let's see first, uh, the lose the game. It's going to be an update function. Uh, 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 where is it? Where is it? There we go. When we lose the lives, we're going to go to mode equals over, but we're also going to go lock out equals T plus, let's go 30. Let's go for one, one second, 30 frames. So we're going to take what, what the current num, what the number of the frame is that we're currently on. I'm going to add 30 to it. And this is going to be kind of like, a goal for us in the future to wait until uh, to kind of like stop accepting button inputs until we reach that point in the future that we set ourselves up to which is going to be 30 frames in the future right um right this is over and i also want to do the same thing with win can we find win oh i haven't explained how this works uh you go Control f and this allows you to search for something so I'm going to search for win. It hasn't found anything. Well, you can go because it only searches the tab that you're currently in. Uh, if you can then afterwards, if you press control G, it will search for the next result in this, uh, uh, this tab, but there is no results in this tab. If you then press control H, it will look through all of the tabs and now it will actually cycle through all of the results in all of the tabs. So control F is to start a search. So search for, for end. Control G that's right next to it is, is to cycle through all of the results in the, the current tab that you have selected. And control H is to cycle through all of the results through, throughout all of the tabs. F, G, H, right next to each other, very easy to find, very easy to remember. So we're looking for win. And we're gonna press Control H to find, to look through all of the tabs, and there we go. Um, there is where we set the mode to win. 
And this is where we're also gonna say, okay, do a lockout 30 frames, please. Now we're gonna to have to actually implement lockout. That's gonna be an update function. So we're gonna go if lockout is smaller, uh, if lock, no, wait, if t is smaller than lockout, no, if it's greater or equals than lockout, there we go. Or how are we going to, do? no, actually we're gonna do it like this. If t is smaller than lockout, then, and we're gonna just go return. So if the current frame is smaller, so we, if we haven't reached um, the lockout number yet, the lockout frame yet, <laughs> the, the frame that, that ends the lockout, uh, then we just returning. A return, as I said, finishes or terminates uh, a function. Uh, we're gonna terminate the function and we're not good, even gonna listen to button presses or whatever. We're just gonna ignore all of these things because we're still waiting for that future frame. Uh, that's gonna be maybe 30 frames in the future uh, to come up. And we're gonna paste the same thing in a game over. Okay, let's try this. Oh, I have to die actually. I forgot. And now it didn't work. And now I was mashing, mashing the buttons, but it didn't actually react. And this will give us a bit more uh, playroom to um, to uh, to react to kind of like something. I was wanted to maybe show exactly what is happening in case uh, there's some uncertainty just for the people who are like, hey, what, what is doing here with this T? Because I, we're gonna use this a lot and I want, uh, I think it's a cool trick uh, because otherwise you have to do like a count on variable. That's basically would, would also work well. The problem with the count on variable is that you always have to count up the countdown variable uh, and the T is kind of like a universal countdown. So we um, you still have to use variable. You have, we have to create the lock out variable, but you don't have to manipulate this as you tick down. You just wait until t arrives at the, the point that you set yourself up to. So I'm going to print uh, t and I'm going to print, I'm going to just print lockout. All right. Right now you can see t is ticking up. That's the first number. The second number is lockout variable. And you can see that the lockout variable is just stays at zero. It's just not reacting right now. Again, still not reacting. You can see t, t is ticking up. Now I'm going to die. You see, uh, now lockout was set to something that's larger than t, and it took a second for t to catch up with lockout. Now t is over, way above lockout value. But for one second, t was below lockout. And for that second, um the update function would just permanent um, prematurely terminate and it wouldn't actually um, react to button presses. Let's look at this again. Pay close attention to what's happening to T. You can maybe have to slow it down. See, T was a uh, lockout. The second value was set to 190, but T was below 190 for a second. And then it caught up to it and went above it again because, you know, T is constantly advanced. This is, by the way, I haven't really pushed this, but I think this is a very useful tool to kind of understand what is happening. Just print the variables on the screen. <laughs> just print, like if you don't know, like something is happening, I don't even know, just print it on the screen. Anyway, where were we? Um, uh, so today, I wanted to do two big things and it's kind of like, uh, Problematic is because we are we wasted so much time with um, the housekeeping. But um, let's just start with the um, uh, flexible width and height of the collision, right? So we said um, the uh, end, the final boss uh, is kind of like a big sprite, and it doesn't do collision detection correctly because our collision detection currently expects that the sprites are eight pixels in width and eight pixels in height. That's not good. So we need to maybe introduce a new property to those uh, sprites and uh, update our collision detection. Now I wanted to show, uh, set it to, where is, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm looking for it. There we go. I want to save the beginning wave to three so we can immediately start into the boss fight. 
so we can immediately test the problem. So you can see here, I hit the boss, and here I have my shots fly past. Well, it would be nice and useful if we had a property of um, the boss that basically goes, uh, this is by the way in the fourth tab where we're spawning the enemies, is spawn and function. We're gonna introduce a new property to our, uh, to our uh, sprites. Uh, and we're gonna call this collision with, we're gonna set it to 16 and collision height, collision height, we're gonna set it to 16. Now we want our collision detection to uh, use these properties. The only problem that we have is that we have to set this um, collision width and collision height. We have to set it to all of the other uh, sprites as well, not just for the boss sprite, but also for the others. They have to be set to eight. We kind of expect it to be eight already, but we now want to update the collision de uh, detection function to work with you know different sprite different sprite sizes which means retroactively we have to kind of like set a default size for call width and call height um now this is this brings up a question um squidlight actually one of the supporters uh, suggested that we create maybe a function that creates kind of like a default sprite and uh uh, we can, because right now, you know, we also have to like sprite width and sprite height. Remember, we had to also do the same thing with sprite width and sprite height. We introduced a new property that was dealing with the boss. We do this one exception, right? And we had to retroactively introduce the same property to, to every sprite in our game. We had to hunt down all those places where we create a sprite. So why not have a, you know, make sprite function that just creates a sprite for us that already has all these default uh, values set to a reasonable number and then uh, we just have to change the number for all the sprites that are out of the ordinary. So let's just do that. Uh, I think we should have done it previously. Um, so we're going to go into tab one and we're going to create a new function and we're going to call this make make SPR, make sprite. It just creates a sprite for us. Um, I'm gonna call this local my SPR, my sprite. Um, we're gonna give it an X and a Y, why not? Um, we're gonna set, we're gonna give it a flash value. Uh, we're gonna give it an animation frame. Um, gonna, it should be all my SPR. Uh, we're going to give it a SPR, a sprite. Uh, it's going to be zero. Just like just default values. So these are exist. So these are not necessarily set to nil because if something is set to nil, then there's going to be errors. And then, you know, and here's sprite width and sprite height. That's the last one, last property that we had to upgrade to this way. And now call width and call height. Collision width and collision height. We can add this here as well. Uh, but uh, the default is not going to be 16, it's going to be 8, because so far that's the thing that our collision function expected, right? And then after we create the sprite, we're going to go return my sprite. Just a function that creates like a default sprite where all of these default values are kind of already filled in. And then we can take that and upgrade the values and change them to whatever is needed in every, every specific case. All right, and then we can just here, we can in the, the uh, enemy spawning function, instead of using my n equals and then creating a new empty object, we can just uh, instead say make sprite. And then we can get rid of, for example, the flash, the animation frame, sprite width and sprite height, because this, all of this stuff is already uh, taken care of by the make sprite function, right? These are already taken care of. Marvelous. So let's apply this as well. Um, let's just see if this works, by the way. I just want to make sure that this didn't make any... Okay, the boss doesn't... We have to take care of the boss in a second. But yeah, so far, so good. Uh, there's no fatal error so far. Okay. So we want to apply this also when we create our uh, ship here. That's in tab number zero when we start the game. 
There we create a ship uh, sprite. We're going to use again the make sprite function. And that allows us to get rid of those two lines. Nice. And also the ship now has collision width and collision height. That's the new thing that we just did, right? These things are now also applied to the ship. Let's run this just to make sure that everything works correctly. That works correctly, that's good. Now we're gonna also apply this to the, um, the bullets. Here, where are the bullets? Uh, update function, when we press the buttons, here. Again, instead of the create an empty object, new bullet, create an empty object, we're just gonna put in make sprite. And then we can get rid of, for example, these two uh, lines because they were setting the sprite width and sprite height variables and those are already be taken care of the my make sprite function. See, we kind of like bring things together into in like a universal function and that allows us to simplify things elsewhere. And in the future, when we want to expand the sprites to have some kind of other function, some other property that we really need every sprite to have, then we can uh, do this in the make sprite function and we don't have to chase down, you know, all the different places where we create sprites. It's all taken care of uh, with this function. That's good. That's good. Okay, so now the collision detection. That's actually not going to be as difficult as you might think. Uh, let's go to the collision detection. Right, so you can see the seven here. I already talked about this, right? And the seven was the width and height of the sprite. And we already talked about this, how you think it would be eight because there are, the collision detection expects the sprites to be eight uh, times eight, but it's not eight, it's seven. Because again, this one off, you start counting at the first, it's seven, it's always one less than the actual width and height of the sprite. Um, so yeah, so for our um, big boss guy here, that's gonna be 16 times 16. Uh, but minus one, right? Actually, the, this guy doesn't actually fill the sprite completely, so well, whatever. Uh, it's always good to for the collision box for the enemies. But it's, it's fine. It's, it's it's a bit bigger than the sprite because you just want to hit the enemies. You know, you just like you don't don't, don't normally be like if you just graze the enemy. It's fine if that counts as a hit, as a hit, especially if it's like a big boss. Right. So instead of the seven here, we want to just like. Um, pull in the collision width and collision height from the uh, from the object that we're colliding here. So in this case, it's object number uh, number A. <laughs> object A, oops, oh no, oh no, oh no, okay. A dot call width, because this is about um, the right edge of the, of the, of the sprite. So we add uh, instead of the seven, we pull the width of the um, of the sprite of the collision box from uh, from the sprite object. But as we said, it's not the width; it's the width minus one, right? So we add a minus one, or we subtract the one at the end. And the same thing we're going to do here with the height. That's it. That's that's all of it. We're just pulling the information from from uh, from the object and just filling in, in uh, replacing the seven with the information that is contained in the object. Now here we have to be careful. So it's uh, for the right, B right, from the right edge of the B box, um, we have to do width, collision width, and we have to also make sure that it's B in both cases because we are talking about the B object here. And that's it, that's all it is. Just like replacing the sevens with the data from the object. And then let's see. Beautiful. Oh, have you seen this? This was again. Oh, yeah, baby. Get wrecked. <laughs> Spring. Yeah. Oh, this is enjoy enjoyable. Okay, so let's see if the smaller objects uh, collide correctly. Yeah, they do. It's fine. It's fine. It's good. Yeah, 
No problem so far. Let's see if my our ship can collect with the uh, our ship can collect collide with the with the guys. Yeah, that, that seems fair. That seems like a fair coll collision there. Good. Actually, at this point, I w wanted to do a little upgrade. Um, I don't like the bullet quite as much as I thought I would. What about if you have a bit of an arrow bullet? Because the thing is, the bullet is very round. I'm gonna cop. I copy the bullet over to a new sprite uh, because I wanted to maybe keep the big round bullet uh, for the future. But I wanted to maybe make a slimmer bullet, something like this, right? Now the slimmer bullet would have to have a different collision box, but now we can't do that, right? Um, so. If it's perfectly centered in a sprite, we cannot really do this because you know, then we cannot take care of the left side. You have to just move it to the left, top left edge of the sprite. Oh, hey, here's Christian from a, from a future with a quick assist. So the way I move around the image is using the cursor keys. So left, right, up and down. And that moves basically all of the pixel within the, the drawing frame, left, uh, right, up and down. And that's really nice to kind of be able to reposition uh, a sprite within its confines, right? Moving on, like this. So it's hugging the left side. Um, and then maybe something like, I don't know, something like this. You know, I um, the reason why I'm doing this is that I felt, I feel like the bullets are flying. I feel it feels more right. It feels a bit more right if um, the bullets are kind of elongated along the axis in which they're flying. So now it looks more like a fireball and before it was just like this hovering orb, but now it seems like it has more of a direction, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's elongated along an axis, along the axis of travel. Um, this makes the bullet less flexible uh, for like, you know, like spread shot kind of thing. So if you are using a spread shot thing, maybe you want to keep the big ball bullet, but I think for like, shooting straight, I think this might be a better bullet. Now the width of this bullet has changed, the collision width. Now this is no longer eight pixels in width, now this is um, a six pixels in, in width. And now this gives an opportunity to test out this new collision system. Uh, so now that I upgrade the sprite, I'm gonna go to the, when you're spawning the bullet. Uh, it's here, right? Now in uh, tab number two, uh, update function, when we're pressing the button, and we're gonna go new bull uh, collision width. We're gonna set it to six. Now they won't be the bullets will be a little bit left, hugging the left side a little bit. We have to move them uh, one pixel to the uh, to the right to compensate. Uh, we're gonna here go um, when we spawn the bullets, the X position of the bullet. I'm gonna go plus one on the X position. Now they center it again, they center on the ship, that seems good. Now this gives me actually a good opportunity while we're here is to address the problem. I think some person in the comments suggested this and I think that's a good idea. Uh, it was Farley Reynards who suggested this. So I don't like how the flash, the muzzle flash, it's, it's not quite, like it's not centered because it can't be centered. It's, um, you know, we talked about this, how our sprites are an even number of pixels and the, uh, the circles that Pico 8 draws are an odd number of pixels. So we cannot really center the muzzle flash on the uh, sprite, but we can draw two muzzle flashes and we absolutely gonna do that. So uh, let us see, where are we, are we drawing the muzzle flash? Drawing enemies, draw game here, maybe drawing enemies. There is muzzle. So this is gonna be in the a third tab, draw function, big draw function. And here's muzzle. And we're just gonna draw a second muzzle. Uh, but we're gonna offset it by one pixel to the right. So we're gonna have two uh, circles overlapping each other, but but being you know one pixel apart and they will, they will do, this will create a bit of an egg shaped muzzle flash but that's okay i think it will be see it's not egg shaped now but i feel it's uh, it looks a bit better i feel now that it, there's it's so wide maybe it's a bit too big um so let us see if we can make the muzzle a bit smaller i i can't believe i'm saying this but yeah i think let's go down uh again tap two update function where we're pressing the button 
Uh, let's go down onto five. Yeah, I think this, this looks better, especially since the bullet is a little bit smaller now as well. And that is it. And you know what? Sadly, this episode has been going for a long time and I don't want this to be over an hour long. So let us move the spawning of waves to the next episode. Let's tackle that in the next episode and let's just go straight to the doggy zone. That's right, the doggy zone. And actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the task on our hands to the doggy zone. So I'm gonna spoil it to you how we're gonna tackle the waves. I want to just do straight space invaders. I just want to, a wave is just going to be a screen full of enemies. So the task for the doggy zone is going to be find out how to make this work. Try to make it so that when uh, you, we spawn wave number one, instead of spawning one poultry enemy, I want you to just fill the screen with enemies, with an array of enemies. I want you to try to find out how to do this. It's going to be up to you. Um, I thought about something, I think in my tests, 10 enemies, at least 10 enemies, a row of 10 enemies, and then at least four rows of 10 enemies. Just fill the screen. Um, you can make the enemies stop for now, so they're not moving, just staying there and waiting to get shot. <laughs> That's my favorite kind of enemy. Try to make that work, and if you can't figure it out, we're gonna do this in the next episode. Now, this is the part where I will give a big shout out to the people at Coffee. Yes, but obviously not the people working at Coffee, but the people supporting me on Coffee. It's time for a little shout out segment. It's been a month since the last one, and I would like to welcome all of my new supporters Andrea D'Amicio, Atti Kurz, Brandon Black, Caleb Blankenbaker, Casey A. Childers, Code Logic, Corvus, Dave Lehmann. Dracula, Dr. Zamako, El Ferna, Ghosted Bones, Heinz Stampfli, Lems G, Lennart Steinke, Leon, Mark Lur, Mladen Mihalovic, Nexalam, Notters, Pini, Piotr Bzdura, Smooth Turkey, Vapid Vile, and Will Brown. And as always, big shout outs to the growing regular Donut Plus crew, including Tom Hall, Sean Manget, James Washington, Ted Carter, BB Samurai, Andrew Edstrom, Squarf, Farley, Chemix, Pixel Jochen, ADG, Brian Baldwin, Scotty, GBG, Burion Davies, Andrew, Shaya, Phil, The Gecko, Jan, JBat70, Miguel Biriam, Blixton, Jer, Art Sturgeon, Angelo Dante, Maciek, Arya JP, Lost Deku, Bellorek, Pendletong, Groove MD, Lackmare, Creeper Speak, The Coxworth, Cheap Shot, One Eyed Rabbit, Mario Carballo, Kevin Thompson, Pavel Shimchikovsky, Bretsky, Emperor Snow, Hnork, and All Caps. And if you aren't already, you can also support this channel on Coffee. One of the major perks is that you'll gain access to new episodes of the series earlier, so there's no need to wait. And there's also all sorts of other behind-the-scenes features. Check it out at coffee.com slash lazydevs. Mm-hmm, that's right. All right, guys, so this was a big catch-up episode. I returned from my own doggy zone to give you... I'm really hyped and pumped to see, you know, the new developments. Sadly, the housekeeping took a little bit too long, but there were some, some juicy, juicy morsels in there. Next episode, we're gonna jump into the creation of the waves. We're gonna have enemies. They're gonna be attacking us. It's gonna be awesome. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.